Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem is the three-dimensional version of the circulation form of Green's theorem. So remember there was a flux form and a circulation form. Well, this is the circulation form of Green's theorem now put in two dimensions, uh, three dimensions. So on the left side is the picture that has the circulation form of Green's theorem. Notice that this version is a cross product of the Dell operator and the vector field. And that dot product is with um, a constant vector. This guy over here is with the normal vector. Okay, so you've got to first figure out which way the vectors are pointing from the surface before you can calculate using Stokes theorem. The idea is that you can take these um, calculations and reduce them to simple line integrals using Stokes theorem, which tells you how the simple line integral is related to the more complicated cross product function. So if you want a couple of um, pictures, how do you figure out which way it's going? Right hand rule. I right? use the right hand rule to figure out which direction the normal vectors are going, but you got to pay attention to which direction the curve is going, right? If the curve is going that way, that's the direction that you put your um, hand, right? The four fingers of your hand go in that direction. And then you point your thumb in the direction of the normal vectors. So here's the theorem, Stokes theorem. I've got a vector field FGH. I've got a del operator, right? That's that gradient symbol without anything in it. It's just a partial x, partial y, partial z. I'm going to do a cross product with the vector field, take that answer, and then do a dot product with the normal vector, the normal vector being the one that points out from the surface. My claim is that that's the same thing as doing a simple line integral by Stokes' theorem. So let's take an example and do it both ways to see that we get the same answer. So here is my vector field. Y negative x and 10. The surface that I'm looking at is the upper half of a sphere, and the C is the unit circle with the radius of 1. So I'm going to use Stokes' theorem. I'm going to use a, a line integral, and I'm going to see if I get the same thing. All right, so let's first set it up with Stokes' theorem. Well, I, I mean, this whole thing is Stokes' theorem, but let's do it with the um, gradient calculations. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the cross product of the del operator and the vector field. So I can list out ijk, partial x, partial y, partial z. And then I put my vector field y, negative x, and 10. OK, this is going to yield a vector. Partial y with respect to 10 is 0. Partial z with respect to x is 0. OK, minus j. Partial x with respect to 10 is 0. Partial z with respect to y is 0. Yeah, OK. And then for k, the partial x with respect to negative x is negative 1 minus partial y with respect to y is 1. So I end up with the vector 0, 0, negative 2. All right, so from the first step, we figured out that the cross product of the del operator and vector f came out to be simply 0, 0, negative 2. Okay. The next step requires us to find the normal vector for the sphere. And it turns out we don't want just the normal vector, we want the unit normal vector. So we want to find the unit normal vector for the sphere because that was the equation that was given to us, right? If we go back to the original problem, it says that S is the region that's the upper half of that sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And so we want to find the unit normal vector for the sphere. Now, in your textbook in section 17.7, there is a whole chart. And actually, this is the exact same chart. So you don't have to go through the book. You can use this over here if you're working on the homework. And it gives you the surface. It gives you the equation. It gives you the normal vector. And then it gives you the magnitude. So if you want the unit normal vector, you got to take the normal vector and divide it by the magnitude. So up on the top here, it gives you a general formula, right? Because not everything is going to fit one of these four shapes. 
But for those four surfaces, cylinders, cones, spheres, and paraboloids, they lay it out for you. So a sphere is in the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a squared. In our case, a is 1. How do I know? Well, because the formula they gave us was x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. So for our sphere, the a value on the other side is just 1. Okay. So for a sphere, here is our normal vector, and then the magnitude is a over z. Well, if a is 1, then the magnitude is 1 over z. All right, so let's come back over here, and we're going to write ourselves a note that the normal vector, I'm just going to call it v for a second because it's not a unit normal vector yet. So that normal vector is going to be x over z, y over z, 1. All right, so does that match up? x over z, y over z, 1. And then remember we said the magnitude was 1 over z because a was 1. All right, so if I want the unit normal vector, I should take the vector that I have up there and divide it by the magnitude, which is 1 over z. Well, can you see that this is the same thing as taking that vector and multiplying it by z? All right, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'll end up with z times x over z y over z1, which means that my unit normal vector is going to be x, y, z. All right, so I went through the process now of finding that unit normal vector. That unit normal vector is x, y, z. All right, so my third step then is to take the cross product that I have from the top, the normal vector from the bottom, and take the dot product. So step three is to take the dot product of the cross product with the del operator on the top and the unit normal vector. So again, this is not just the normal vector. This is the unit normal vector. So it should be relatively simple. That first entry is a vector 0, 0, negative 2. That second entry is also a vector x, y, z. When we take the dot product of a vector and another vector, we get a scalar. So we get 0 times x plus 0 times y plus negative 2 times z. So the dot product of those two vectors gives me negative 2z. Now, go back for a second and see what Stokes' theorem tells us. It tells us we've got to take the double integral over the surface of the cross product dot the normal vector, which we already figured out that this is negative 2z, but it's got to be integrated over the surface. Well, we can use a little bit of geometry to help us find surface area, and then we only have to worry about integrating 2z. So we can iterate our integral by finding the surface area. So in the process of iterating our integral, my step four is going to be to find ds. So ds, it told us, was the upper half of a sphere with a radius of one, right? So if it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one, and it told us it was the upper half, which for the calculations of surface area, doesn't matter whether it's the upper or lower half. So we want half the surface area of a sphere that has a radius of one. Well, dig back into your geometry knowledge. How do I find the surface area of a sphere? The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So that means half the surface area is 2 pi r squared, but let's replace the r with a 1. And so I get 2 pi. So that's what I'm going to use as my ds. All right, then the next step is to integrate and multiply by ds. What are we going to integrate? Well, we're going to integrate that 2z that we came up with in the previous step. So when we took the dot product of that cross product and the unit normal vector, we ended up with an expression that was 2z. Actually, it was negative 2z. Yes, it was negative 2z. So we're going to integrate negative 2z 
from zero to one, right? That's where the Z values range. And then when we get done with that, we're gonna take that and multiply it by two pi. So the two pi is the DS part. The zero to one is the integral with respect to Z that we got from that dot product. So when I do this, I'll get a negative two Z squared over two. Those cancel out nicely, which gives me a negative Z squared at one and at zero which is negative one. And then we've got to multiply those two terms together. So we're going to multiply negative one times two pi. And our answer is negative two pi. So that's what we get with the one form of Stokes theorem, right? The form of Stokes theorem that has us working with the double integral over the surface in this particular problem for that upper half of the sphere gives us an answer of negative two pi. Now that we've done that, Let's take a look at it the other way with the line integral and see if we get the same answer. First thing is I need to turn C into a curve with parameters. So we'll let X equal cosine of T, Y equal sine T, which means that my R is now cosine T sine t zero, right? I don't have a third component, so I'll put it for zero. All right, second thing is, let's take this f equals y negative x 10 and turn that into parameters. So the y is the sine of t, the x is negative cosine t, and the third coordinate is 10. Now, let's derive R. Derive R. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of zero is still zero. All right, my next step will be to find F dot dr, which is the dot product of these two vectors here. So sine times negative sine is negative sine squared t. Cosine times negative cosine is negative cosine squared t. And 10 times 0 is 0. You realize that if I factor out a negative 1, this becomes sine squared t plus cosine squared t plus 0, which is just negative 1. And now my last step is integrate from 0 to 2 pi of f dot dr. Well, f dot dr is negative 1. So we integrate from 0 to 2 pi of negative 1 dt, which gives us negative t evaluated at 2 pi and at 0, negative 2 pi. Same answer, right? Here, I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see. Same answer either way. What's the difference between them? Well, there's two things. One is I didn't have to set up that cross product matrix and figure out the determinant using that cross product formula. The other thing is I didn't need to memorize or use a chart value to find that normal vector. It became simply part of my problem. So I didn't need to do that whole set of work. I could just turn it into a line integral and calculate it from there. All right, let's try another one. This one, we'll, we'll use the right side of Stokes theorem with the cross product to figure out the surface integral for this funky looking vector field, x squared minus z squared, y and 2xz, where I'm looking across the boundary of a plane in the first octant. So the first thing is, Let's calculate the cross product of the del operator and the vector field. All right, so we'll do the cross product of the del operator and the vector field. So I've got my i, j, k. I've got my partial x, partial y, partial z. And then f was x squared minus z squared. That was the first component, y. 2xz. All right, so this gives me i times what? Partial y with, and 2xz gives me 0. Partial z and y gives me 0. All right, minus j, 
And now the partial derivative of 2xz with respect to x just gives me 2z. Go the other direction now. The partial derivative of z and x squared minus 2z is going to give me minus a negative 2z. And now the k vector will give me the partial x partial derivative of y with respect to x. That's a 0 and a 0 the other way as well. So this becomes the vector 0. 2 minus a negative 2 is 4. With the negative on the outside, minus 4z, 0. All right, now I'm going to find the normal vector. And I can use this formula, the partial z with respect to x, the negative partial z with respect to y, and 1. Because really, that's what we've been doing all along, except we've been using a table to help us out. So the partial derivative of the function with respect to x is just negative 1, right? Because it was given as 4 minus x minus y equals z. So the partial with respect to x is negative 1. The partial with respect to y is negative 1 also, except the formula says, change the sign, so it's positive 1, last one is 1. All right, now we need limits of integration for x and y. What does this region look like? Well, if I set z equal to 0, then I'm going to end up with 4 minus x minus y equals 0, or y equals 4 minus x. Okay, what does 4 minus x look like? It's a y-intercept of 4 and x-intercept of 4. So the x's go from 0 to 4, right? In this way, the x's go from 0 to 4. What do the y's do? The y's go from 0 to 4 minus x. Okay? And the x's go from 0 to 4. So now, let's take the dot product of the cross product and the normal vector. So my next step is to take the dot product of this vector here and the normal vector. When I do that, I'm going to try to not get rid of those off my screen. So 0 times negative 1 is 0. Negative 4z times 1 is negative 4z plus 0. So this gives me negative 4z. And now I want to set up the integral. So I'm going to set it up as the double integral of negative 4z dy dx with the y's going from 0 to 4 minus x. That's why I put it on the inside because it's more complicated. The x is going from 0 to 4. All right, I can replace this z with a 4 minus x minus y. Negative 4 times 4 minus x minus y. So this gives me the double integral of negative 16 plus 4x plus 4y. And I'm going to integrate that first with respect to y. So I get negative 16y plus 4xy plus 4y squared over 2 is 2y squared evaluated at y equals 4 minus x and at y equals 0. So really, we only have to worry about the top half, right? Because the bottom half is just going to give us 0. All right, let's replace all those y's with 4 minus x's. And we get negative 16 times 4 minus x plus 4 times x times 4 minus x plus 2 times 4 minus x squared. Wouldn't it be easier if I could factor out a 4 minus x and a 2? Let's do that. 2 times 4 minus x. And I'm left with what? A negative 8 
4x divided by 2 is 2x. And this then gives me just a 4 minus x. So I'm left with 2 times 4 minus x times negative 4 plus x. And so this gives me now 2 integral from 0 to 4 of negative 16. 4x plus 4x is 8x minus x squared. All right, so not too, too bad. This will give me a negative 16x plus 4x squared minus x to the third over 3. And now I just have to put the 4 in there. We're almost done. And multiply it by 2. So I get 2 times negative 16 times 4 plus 4 times 4 squared is 16 minus 4 to the third is 64. Hey, look at this. Those go away. Negative 128 over 3. That's the value that I was looking for. All right, the nice thing about Stokes theorem is you can take these rather complicated surface integrals, right? Look at what we just did over there. And you can turn them into much more simple line integrals. So let's try one that deals with line integrals. Let's bring this one up here. Value of the surface integral, and it's given as a really complicated looking function, right? The del operator dot the a del operator cross the vector field dot the normal vector integrated over some surface. And the field we're looking at is x, y, z. The surface is the upper half of an ellipsoid. Assume the normal vectors point upward. So we could do this with the whole process of finding normal vectors and setting up all the cross products and operators and everything else, wouldn't it be nice if I could turn this into a line integral? Right? Maybe this will end up being shorter than that last problem we did. So the first thing is, let's set up our parameters with z equals 0. So if z equals 0, then I'm left with x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. So x is equal to 2 times the cosine of t. The square root of 9 is 3. So I get 3 sine of t. And we said we're going to set it up with z equals 0. So there is z equals 0. This is my r. So that must mean that r prime is the derivative of what's up there. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative 2 sine t. The derivative of sine is cosine, so 3 cosine of t and then zero. All right, now let's set up the vector field in terms of parameters. The field we were given was x, y, z. So x is 2 cosine t, y is 3 sine t, and because there's no z component, we'll just put a zero in there. We want to go all the way around that ellipse, so we're going to have to go from 0 to 2 pi, and we'll set up the integral of f dr. Right, so we'll integrate from 0 to 2 pi of f dot dr, which gives me the integral of negative 4 sine t cosine t plus 9 cosine t sine t plus 0 integrated with respect to t. So we're integrating from 0 to 2 pi of 5 sine t cosine t dt. All right? You may have an idea where this is going because I have a feeling we've done a couple like this before. Let u be sine t and then du is cosine t dt. So I'm going to get the integral of 5u du. But then what happens to my limits of integration? Sine of 2 pi is 0. 
sine of zero is zero. So I don't even have to do the whole integration. It just becomes zero, which means that the net circulation is zero. As much as moving in the direction of the curve as is moving against the curve. All right, so this just means that the net circulation is zero. And I took Stokes theorem and that allowed me to set up that integral more easily. All right, let's look at one other thing and then we're done with this section. Let's take a look at curl. In three dimensions, you're thinking of curl as the average circulation over the surface. So if you already know what the velocity vector is, you just need the cross product of the del operator and the velocity vector to get the curl. The cross product is going to be another vector. So let's take a quick look at what we have up here. So this gives us our velocity. So we're going to take our ijk, our del operator, dx, dy, dz, and then I'm going to get a 1 minus z squared, 0, 0. Right, you realize that the i is going to give me nothing. Right? When I put out that 2 by 2 determinant, I'm just going to get 0 minus 0. Right? Then for the j, I'm going to end up with a 0 minus, now take the partial derivative of 1 minus z squared with respect to z, and I'll get negative 2z. Then for the k's, I'm going to get 0, and then the derivative of z squared with respect to y is also 0. So this gives me a vector. 0, <laughs> look at this, I got three negatives. Negative 2z, 0. That's my three-dimensional curl. So that must mean that the maximum rotation is in the direction of the y-axis. And in fact, the further away from the z-axis you go, the more it increases. If z is positive, it rotates clockwise. If z is negative, it rotates counterclockwise. But that's what the curl gives me. Average circulation over the oriented surface. And so calculating it this way, I figure out that in this particular case, the maximum rotation was in the direction of the y-axis. That's the only one that has a component. And that's the end of this section.